Good afternoon and welcome to the final class of Friday afternoon of the fall virtual continuing education for the Board of Building Standards. This is Meg Foley. I'm your host and moderator and with me today is Rob Johnson. We are <clears throat> Rob's going to be presenting a class for the final hour of today called BBS Investigations. Rob is an architect administrator with the Board of Building Standards. He is the architect administrator chiefly responsible for uh, communication with the building departments uh, as well as approval of the um, conformity bodies, the listing laboratories and testing laboratories, that kind of thing. <laughs> Um, but for these purposes, he's primarily responsible also for the complaints and investigations part of the work that we do here at the board. Um, Rob's a very knowledgeable and experienced guy. I'm sure you're going to learn a lot from him. Um, he assures me his material is not run the whole hour. We might have some time for questions at the end, but if we don't, <laughs> Uh, we uh, please just enter your questions into the Q&A. We'll be sending out a written response to all of the Q&A from the last two days uh, to all of the participants in this seminar. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for participating. Here's Rob Johnson. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon with the Building Code Academy. And uh, I'll be presenting our last session today on investigations and certification maintenance. Um, this particular seminar uh, I routinely have given in the past. Uh, some of you may have been in it before. Uh, normally we cover about two to three hours worth of material. Um, lots of information is shared in that, uh, including examples and things of that nature. Obviously with our time constraints today, we're going to be limited in that. So it's going to be more of a uh, overview, kind of 30,000 foot view of our process when it comes to dealing with complaints and investigations. We'll talk briefly at the end about um, how to maintain your certification. So uh, sit back and uh, uh, if you have questions, feel free to uh, go into the chat area and uh, post that. Uh, Meg will uh, bring those up to us later in the program. Uh, so Meg, uh, with that, let's go ahead and begin the uh, presentation, please. Your presentation is live. Our information that we'll be covering today is specifically dealing with the board's process related to certification maintenance purpose and the learning objectives of our hour together will be uh, to discuss how investigations are a necessary aspect of analyzing allegations, complaints, and problems related to code enforcement. Um, I will give you some information along the way that will help you deal with this uh, because uh, complaints come from all different directions. And the information I'll share today will help you at the local level uh, when you're dealing with complaints at, uh, at the local level. Uh, so suffice it to say, uh, the purpose really is to talk about how the Board of Building Standards accepts complaints, and when they find evidence of alleged violations, they ask and authorize the board staff to perform an investigation and then report back their findings to the board for their consideration. And if required, uh, to administer disciplinary actions or remedial correction uh, for the certification holder. Our learning objective today is uh, in the hope that the corrective actions required by the board uh, can ensure you as a certification holder to be encouraged to adopt board's standards practice, standard of practice in your own performance of required enforcement protocols and the maintenance of your own certification. So we'll cover five areas today. We'll talk about complaints and then sources and common complaints, uh, which we view as violations. The investigation process, the disciplinary process, 
And then at the end, we'll briefly talk about certification maintenance. So we have to start with how the board has the statutory authority to certify individuals and building departments and boards of appeals. This information is found in the High Revised Code, Section 3781, under powers and duties of the board. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday in the Chapter 1 training, High Revised Code and the High Administrative Code can be easily accessed through Law Writer in the internet. Um, if you're not familiar with looking at the rules of the board or the statutory requirements that uh, empowers the board for who they are as an authority, uh, feel free to look into that. Uh, it's good information. So the board has the authority to certify and revoke or suspend any residential or non-residential, meaning commercial, building department, sub-department, individuals, and local boards of appeal. These are the entities that inf exercise enforcement authority, accept and approve construction documents, perform inspections, issue orders for non-compliance, and issue certificates of occupancy. So we're now going to start with complaints and we'll talk about um, what these represent uh, to your constituents, why they complain, um, or why other people who are certified complain uh, to the board with regards to things that are going on in the enforcement industry. So we have a perspective to complaints. Obviously complaints occur, uh, it's human nature. We don't like something, we complain about it. This is normal. But uh, it usually deals with two specific aspects of life. It's either objections to situations that occur or disputes with people. So since this is just common to us, uh, we can always learn how to do this better and how to handle complaints. So we must try to discern and understand why complaints occur. We must also master how to manage and learn from complaints to help ourselves and to help those that we serve. And we must recognize the difference between just grumbling about things we don't like versus legitimate concerns or transgressions that exist out there. Our approach to complaints at the board is this. We process complaints and we use three soft skills or personal attributes that enable us to interact effectively and harmoniously with other people. This basically is three things that everyone should be able to do. You need to have the ability to listen and to understand. That's what we call communication. You need to have a desire to help which means to cooperate. And you need to be able to embrace a civil tone or demeanor that is courtesy or respect or honor towards another person. Kind of consider it as, if you will, conflict resolution. Our position regarding complaints is this. The board hears from complainants when they believe that they have exhausted all local options to resolve their concerns. That's how the board gets our complaints. Ultimately, the complainant must eventually work with you, the building department, and the personnel. Um, we cannot arbitrate between a complainant uh, and a building department. We may be able to help educate and navigate uh, to some degree uh, for the complainant to help them understand uh, that their issue will not be resolved except by working with the local um, individuals of the local authority. Our position also is that the board vets the complaints with the aim to help resolve the issue, especially if no violations exist to the board's certification rules. And if that happens, even if uh, a complainant files a formal complaint, meaning one in writing, 
if there are no violations to the board's rules, the board will dismiss the complaint. But we will encourage the complainant and the building official and anyone else that's involved with the issue uh, to work it out at the local level. Complaints, our analysis. This is a good approach for anyone who is hearing a complaint. You have to distinguish between someone talking out loud and someone who has something legitimate that is a concern. And we uh, define those as inquiries and complaints. An inquiry is someone asking a question for clarification about either the code enforcement process or perhaps code interpretations or even owner's rights. A complaint, though, is someone who submits a written complaint to the board for intervention. The board takes an action to authorize an investigation as it specifically relates to allegations listed in the Ohio Administrative Code 4101 colon 7. Uh, that section of the administrative code is the certification rules. And what we're looking for is violations. This information is also found on the board's website under the uh, code section. So before we go any further, uh, if you have not been, uh, let's say, to chapter one yesterday, uh, or if you have not been through this program before, um, I wanted to at least uh, help you understand uh, how to keep this process in the big picture view. Uh, building code enforcement uh, is a lengthy process. It involves a lot of people, but it primarily involves the owner. The owner is the one who is responsible for co-compliance, period. He may hire a representative such as a design professional, an architect, engineer, maybe even a uh, fire protection systems designer uh, to assist them in providing the information necessary for him to comply with the building code. So when we look at the big picture, uh, you don't just decide that you're going to make a building and then, you know, in two months it's open and you're occupying it. Uh, we all know that there's a process and it, it takes time. There are two pieces to this picture that are absolutely critical um, to the process. Uh, they are legal instruments. They're both represented with the stars. It says Certificate of Plan Approval and Certificate of Occupancy. These are pieces of paper that are legal certifications that allows the owner to do certain things. So the owner decides they want to build a building. They, of course, work with designers, or if it's residential, they may do the work themselves to put together a design or have someone else do it but they choose to build a building. So they take their design and they're supposed to come to the building department and submit their construction documents, and fill out an application. And what that does is it triggers a process for code compliance. So during design, the plans examiners will review the drawings or any documents that includes project manuals, specifications, reports, soil studies, lots of information that is necessary for code compliance. And what they do is they verify by evaluating the design against the building code. If the design meets the criteria and intent of the code, then it can be approved. Oftentimes it doesn't happen though. So the response is the master plans examiner has to communicate. Uh, and in a nutshell, that's what this entire process is all about. It's about communication. 
And so the plans examiner either creates a correction letter or perhaps the jurisdiction uses adjudication orders for correction letters, but they communicate in specific ways as to how the documents, how the design does not comply with the code. And um, in the building department resource packet, there is a copy of the plan examiner record or correction letter, if you will. And you'll see in that form that you have to communicate specific uh, in very specific ways. You have to cite the code section that's in violation. You have to indicate where in the documents the specific violation exists to the design. And then that information is submitted to the designer and to the owner. Remember, the owner is ultimately responsible for code compliance. So he is working with the designer uh, to ensure that that happens. If the owner decides that they want to appeal or the uh, owner wants to appeal uh, to get a variance because they believe that they've met the intent of the code in their design, but the building department has disagreed with that, they can request an adjudication order and appeal. Um, once those uh, hearings are completed and whatever the results are of the appeals board hearings, the information that is gleaned from that has to be incorporated into the design. So the design professional will still have to revise and resubmit the documents and the building department still has to review it and to complete the review. And then the plans examiner notifies the building official who then creates a certificate of plan approval. Again, the certificate of plan approval is something that the building code requires. You will not find the word permit in the building code, um, but your local authority, that is the jurisdiction, the political subdivision, may require permits under their ordinances. If that's the case, um, what still has to be posted on the job site is the permit by local uh, ordinance regulation and the certificate of plan approval has to be posted as well. So once that certificate is issued, it is what uh, we call a license to build. The owner is allowed to commence construction. That creates the second half of this process, the construction and, re and required inspections phase. Now, if you'll notice, the design always points to one goal, and that is the certificate of plan approval. During construction and required inspections, it still always points back to the certificate of plan approval. And this is why. Since the design is now in compliance with the building code, that means that when the building is built, when the required inspections are made, the inspector's responsibility is to ensure that the work being constructed matches the approved construction documents. It's not the duty of the, of, or the responsibility of the inspector to communicate uh, code violations. They are simply to notify uh, the site superintendent and the owner and putting it in writing where work does not match the approved construction documents. So as these required inspections are done, as the construction continues to progress, once the inspections are completed and all certifications and testing of building service equipment is done and that is completed and any variances or subsequent approvals have been inspected as well and found to be in compliance with the approved documents, once that process is done, the building inspector notifies the building official that the building is ready to be occupied. The building official issues a certificate of occupancy for the building, okay? And then that occupancy, that certificate is given to the owner. This is uh, something that's important to realize is that the building is what is co-compliant. And that certificate is indicating that the owner can now occupy that building. Okay, that seems obvious. But the certificate of occupancy always stays with the building. So even though ownership may change or tenants may come and go, 
as long as the building is being maintained and being operated under the way it was originally approved in the way that it has been certified for occupancy, it is still a valid CMO, no matter who owns the building. That's an important thing to know. But again, look at the big picture. The owner is always involved in this process. The building department never takes over this process. They just simply communicate back to the owner or to the owner's representatives when they are not in compliance. That is all. We don't tell them how to do it. We don't direct the work in the field as an inspector. We do not direct the, the design in the office um, by the plans examiner. That is really important. When we step in and get into this process and direct things, we are taking on the possibility of being liable for our own decisions. <clears throat> That's an important point when it comes to dealing with complaints and investigations. So we'll talk more about that later. Let's talk about some sources and common complaints or violations. Complaints come from owners or their representatives, designers, contractors. They can come from certified individuals about other certified personnel or even elected officials. And it can come from appellants that are affected by certified board, uh, appeals boards. Oftentimes the violations are violations to chapter one administrative provisions of both the building code and the residential code. Some of those things are also departments having institutionalized processes that are different than the higher vice code or the administrative code or anything in chapter one. There are complaints about absence of protocol and process and forms during enforcement. Complaints uh, by owners who are, who are denied their legal rights of due process and decision making for their own project. Remember, the owner owns this process. It is not the building department. We just simply administrate a process. The owner is the one who makes all the decisions. And also, it could be ordinance-based enforcement that is in conflict with the code. Oftentimes, we see the property maintenance provisions at the local level sometimes overstep their bounds and get involved with building code enforcement when they don't have the authority to do so. What they do may trigger the building code, which brings the building department back into the picture. But uh, if property maintenance inspectors are doing things above and beyond um, what they're supposed to be doing, and they're actually doing certified duties for code and building code enforcement, then that would be a conflict. And we get uh, complaints on those issues all the time. Some other examples are that plan examination is not thorough or complete. Um, I always try to say uh, during chapter one training that the plan examination needs to be done as far as you can take it. And if you can complete it, then that's great. Even if there are violations to the board's rules, at least that way you're not having to circle back. But don't just do progressive um, plan examination knowing that you're going to have correction items going back to them. Uh, oftentimes, we'll get complaints from people who say, every time I get a correction letter, there's new information on it. That should not be happening unless the, rev the um, revised and resubmitted documents are triggering new provisions of the code that you haven't looked at yet. Um, other things are insufficient data for verifying compliance. If there is not enough information in the documents, you need to communicate that immediately. Let the owner and, and the designer know that the documents are insufficient for completing a plan review. And sometimes uh, non-compliance is not communicated. Um, to be honest, we're not perfect, right? Uh, we miss things. Sometimes the designer misses things. Uh, either way, um, if we see something that doesn't comply, we need to make sure that we're communicating it. Another thing is unaccountable or ineffective enforcement by the building official such as not issuing the certificates of plan approval. I just want to remind you, a permit is not a CPA. 
the certificate of plan approval is basically uh, communicating one thing, and that is this design complies with the code. The permit usually is just an authorization to start work. Uh, it could also be called what's a blanket, uh, a blanket permit, which is basically a, a permit that's wrapping in all types of local approvals and the building department approval for building all into one thing. Either way, certificates of plan approval are required to be issued. Also, orders, adjudication orders not being issued when they should be, uh, denies the owner's rights to appeal. You need to communicate in very clear and direct ways with the owner when they don't comply and allow them to make the decisions. Also, notice is a recommended change. This is something that you'll find in section 108 of the building code, specifically 10862. I always tell my inspectors and I teach every year that they have to have this section memorized because if they do find a code violation in the field that isn't a serious hazard, they should be communicating that information to the building official so that the building official can make a determination on whether or not it needs to be abated. Now, since it's not a serious hazard, I notice a recommended change does something a little different. It is basically a recommendation to the owner that a code violation exists. Somehow it got missed by both the building department and the designer, uh, but it is recommended that they change it. Uh, most conscientious owners will go ahead and go through and make the change, but if it requires a significant change order, they may hedge at it and not do it. Um, the responsibility after that, if the owner chooses not to do it, is that the building official needs to document that as a condition on the CFO. And last, uh, another common violation is, is, is inspectors requiring or ordering changes to the work is not in accordance with those documents, meaning they're directing the work. Um, unfortunately, this comes up on occasion. Um, and what we find is that by an inspector doing that, uh, they could be incurring some liability, number one. And number two is they are not allowing the owner uh, their legal rights. One last thing I want to mention in this portion is that the board doesn't have authority to regulate in certain areas. Majority of these things are, are uh, at the local level, but we get complaints often about these things, such as zoning, like easements being violated or right-of-ways, uh, traffic and uh, civil engineering uh, streets. We do not do anything in terms of regulating rental registration or point of sale inspections or even property maintenance. Now I will say there is one caveat to maintenance that you ought to be aware of. When a building is not being maintained but it is occupied, if the occupancy, excuse me, if the building is not maintained, uh, the building department does have a responsibility to step in if they are made aware of the fact that it's not being maintained. Um, the trigger of that uh, action is actually found in uh, section 111 of chapter one under certificates of occupancy. In one of the charging paragraphs, it indicates that as long as the owner maintains his building, his certificate of occupancy remains valid. Obviously, we want buildings to be maintained because in some instances, if they're not maintained, they become unsafe. So there is um, an opportunity for the building department to step back in if there's a maintenance issue with the building. Oftentimes, so, um, the authority having jurisdiction of existing buildings after the CVO is usually fire. Uh, so the fire marshal or the fire district fire chief, they're the ones that actually uh, exercise authority over the existing buildings. But the building department usually gets triggered if there are things that need to be done.
especially in repairs and replacements, things of that nature. Uh, civil arbitration, legal disputes, or mechanics liens, we will not touch that. Construction or design contracts with the owner. Again, these are civil issues. Personal, personnel or performance issues related to local department policies. Your department may have certain policies in terms of conduct or other types of policies uh, regarding attendance and things of that nature. Um, we will not intervene in those things. You have HR departments, your human, human resources um, departments are the ones who would have authority to deal with those issues. And of course, the rest of these things are, are um, chapter one related applicability and scope of work type of things, but um, we don't have any authority to regulate federal projects and, the, and their laws or OSHA regs or enforcement of residential that's pre-2006 RCO. Uh, we don't know what the local uh, jurisdictions uh, had in place prior to 2006. Uh, a lot of people call us and ask those questions. I want to know what code was in force when I had my house built in 1996. The only thing we can do is turn them back to the building official and, and uh, let them ask the building official what they know was the code being enforced at that time. And of course, utility supply side design of an installation. So all your uh, services that are coming into buildings, PUCO will have the regulatory authority there. Okay, so what the board can do, okay? So we're getting into these issues of violations. These are the five things that the board takes actions on when a complaint is made, an investigation is done, and they need to do something like revoke or suspend or put someone on probation. And, then, and I'm not saying just individuals, but we're also talking about building departments and also appeals boards. So these are the five things that are in this section of the administrative code. If there is a practice of fraud or deceit in obtaining your certification, it is very important when you're getting certified for the first time in a new certification that you are completely truthful with your information. If there's anything in there that is stretching the truth or is incorrect or just a falsehood and somehow that information gets back to the board at some point, they can use that as a basis to decertify or revoke your certification. Another thing is a felony or crime involving moral turpitude. So obviously these are, these are felonies, uh, crimes that uh, basically get you into prison. <laughs> Unfortunately, as an example, um, we dealt with something uh, years ago where someone was embezzling um, money and uh, there was tax evasion going on and the feds were involved. We didn't do anything with the complaint for a very long time, but eventually the feds came back to us um, and also the local authority. Uh, it was the mayor who uh, let us know that that person was going to be incarcerated. Um, then the board on its own motion decided that they would decertify that individual. And it was sad that that happened, um, but um, how we live and what we do really matters. There's also the issue of gross negligence or incompetence. You know, we presume that you know what you're doing, um, but sometimes people do things or direct things um, or just don't do their jobs or don't do them right. And when that happens, uh, that can also be grounds for revocation or suspension. Uh, this one seems kind of trite, but it still matters. The failure to complete continuing education requirements prior to the expiration date. Um, we all have to do continuing education. It's become the new way of the world. So just stay on top of it and try to get it all done before the expiration. And then the last thing, which is really where probably the majority of our complaints uh, land, is violation of duties described in OBC and RCO section 104. These are the specific duties and responsibilities of all certification holders. 
So you may ask, um, who can file a complaint? Well, it's a simple answer, anyone. Anyone can file a complaint. A mayor, one of your constituents, a designer, yourself, person you work with, anyone can file a written complaint against a certified building department or an individual or a board of appeals that is substantiated by demonstrable evidence or upon the board's own motion. So a couple of things uh, that you need to be aware of. The elected officials at your city or county are the ones who are responsible for building department and local boards of appeals certifications. It is not the building officials responsibility. It's the elected officials. So if there's corruption or something going on in a department where lots of people are involved, we hold the elected officials responsible uh, because they're the ones who requested and asked to be certified as a building department and they are responsible for overseeing that it is operating correctly. Personnel, on the other hand, are responsible for their own individual certifications. And if someone has a complaint against them as, a, say, an electrical safety inspector, and yet they have five other certifications, uh, the board is only going to address uh, the violations related specifically to his ESI if that is where the source of the complaint comes from. Even if he is D or she is decertified and no longer is able to be an ESI, they still may have the other certifications and can continue being uh, pursuing jobs in those areas. So let's talk about the investigation process now. The staff reviews the complaint and the evidence submitted and preliminary findings to establish evidence. The item and complaint summary is placed on the board's meeting agenda, which is a monthly meeting, and a recommendation is made at the next available board meeting for their action. The board may choose to authorize an investigation or dismiss the complaint or table the action to allow further review by VVS staff. What we're looking for is clear violations to the board's rules, which warrant a potential disciplinary action and if that's the case, they are generally authorized for an investigation. Again, the board may authorize an investigation on its own motion when they have knowledge of violations that exist or a formal complaint even wasn't submitted. So the board takes this action at its monthly conference meeting. If they authorize the investigation, the board and the executive secretary sends an action letter to the department or the individual certification holder notifying them that the investigation was authorized, excuse me, was authorized. After that, they'll be contacted by board staff to arrange an interview. I will say that uh, investigations, uh, they do take some time. It depends on how complex the issue is and how many people are involved. Um, in the cases involving department certifications, a letter is copied to mayors or county commissioners. Certified individuals are notified separately. Interviews are conducted as required when follow, uh, when the following are required to be involved. So we are always reaching out to the building official. Um, the certified personnel, including any contract personnel, we may talk to non-certified department employees and elected officials or building contractors and designers. We'll maybe talk to property and building owners if that's necessary. And we'll talk to the complainant. So we may have additional questions or need clarification or records that they may have or other witnesses that uh, were part of the event or the situation. Once those interviews are completed, and a review of the documentation and code research is done by the board staff. We report those findings to the board, uh, specifically with the certification committee. The report has the following sections in it. We, of course, put the allegation of the complaint. We'll put any background into the situation or the circumstances. 
We'll list our findings and observations, and then we'll list specific code requirements that are in violation. And that could also be the building code itself, not just chapter one or certification requirements. And then we'll give a conclusion and a recommendation. So the board staff will present this report and make a recommendation of action to the certification committee of the board. The board will take an action based on the certification report findings uh, there that committee and their recommendation and they may act in the following ways again this is after the investigation has been completed but they may at that point still choose to dismiss the complaint depending on what the findings were or to table the matter for further investigation such as new information being presented at the last minute or they can go ahead and, and move forward to suspend or revoke that specific certification, or they can place the certification holder on probation with requirements like additional educational hours, which would normally be above your mandatory 30 hour requirement. After the action of the board, the investigation is closed unless the action was tabled. Then a letter is sent by the executive secretary to the complainant of the board's decision. So now let's talk about disciplinary processes. If the board takes an action to revoke or suspend the department or the individual, they will have a notice of opportunity for hearing sent to the certification holder by certified mail. The holder of the certification has 30 days from the date of the mailing to request a hearing. If a request for the hearing is received, the board may choose to hear the case or move it to a hearing officer. A hearing date is set and the hearing is conducted unless it's waived by the certification holder, meaning the certification holder still has the right to uh, basically pull back. The hearing shall be conducted pursuant to provisions of the higher bias code. And if the hearing officer has been appointed, the officer shall submit a written report at the end of the hearing um, of the findings of fact and their recommendation to the board for their consideration. Following the hearing, the board takes an action at their next meeting, their monthly uh, conference meeting, based on the hearing results and communicates by certified mail to the certified holder. The certification holder may appeal the order within 15 days. So let's say they don't like, uh, you know, what they heard. They don't like the the final determination by the board or the hearing officer, they, you still have the right to appeal. But you have to do it within 15 days of the order uh, to the Franklin County Court of Common Pleas. This is pursuant again to the revised code. So part of the disciplinary process is revocation or suspension. In the event of suspension or revocation of a certification, the individual basically has to stop working under that certification. Meaning they can no longer hold themselves out to the public or any jurisdiction that they are certified to exercise enforcement authority under that certification. Since it's been suspended or revoked. Probation is another action that the board can take. If the board decides not to immediately suspend or revoke, the board may place the individual on probationary status for a period of time and may require remedial action. Now, here's the key. The individual shall comply with the training, reporting, auditing, or other remedial action. If they do not, the board is still able to and authorized to revoke or suspend the individual certification for failure to comply with the remedial requirements. So do not take this lightly if this is the situation you get into. Now, certification maintenance. How, how do we avoid this? We're not going to be able to avoid complaints. Okay, they're just going to come. Uh, oftentimes complaints come from just the constituent or the designer or the owner uh, not really understanding our process um, or they're just confused about what's transpired or 
maybe they feel defrauded in the process somehow. Uh, we just don't know. But complaints will come. But if the following is complied with, complaints are minimized. So we can't say that if you are perfect in your job duties and responsibilities that uh, you won't get a complaint somewhere along the way. But we can assure you that they can be minimized and this is how it happens. Maintenance requires this, that you take your responsibility seriously. A building official is responsible for the following. Okay, so I'm always saying stay in your lane. Um, if you're an inspector, don't feel like you need to do things that the building official does out in the field. Or if you're a plans examiner, don't take the next step and improve the drawings yourself unless you are the building official. The building official is responsible for this, enforcement of the board's rules, that is the building code. They're to conduct themselves in a professional, courteous, impartial, responsive, and cooperative manner. Got to let that sink in for a minute. That really tells us about how we are to be as people. They're to render interpretations of code for compliance, meaning meeting the intent of the code and issue adjudication orders. They are responsible to assure a system is in place to track and audit all projects. Now, if you're a building official at a large jurisdiction, chances are you're not able to do everything that someone at a smaller department who has lesser projects uh, is able to do. Uh, you may have supervisors such as inspector supervisors or plan examiner supervisors or you might even have assistant building officials who you can delegate uh, some of these responsibilities to just because uh, it's a, a, an enormous responsibility to handle 10,000 plus projects a year, as well as do all the administration of the, of the department. That's okay, but you still are responsible to ensure that the system is in place and that you know what's going on with projects. In other words, you know where to get the information and how to get it fast. Does that make sense? I hope. You're also to assure that all building personnel perform their own duties and for the overall administration of the building department. Plans examiners, you're responsible for the examination of construction documents per section 107 in chapter one to determine compliance with the board's rules. Remember, it's not your responsibility to do quality control assurance of designers documents. If the information in the documents is not well done, you do not need to critique that. What you're looking for is specific information with regards to code requirements and risk assessment to ensure that that design complies with the building code. I know it's hard when you see information come in sometimes, but you need to resist the temptation. Focus on making sure that the design complies with the code and that's all. You need to communicate code violations in, in the building design to the building official, to the owner and their representative. Make sure you use the plan examination record that's in, um, in the board's packet. Um, you wanna make sure that those code sections are clear, that the specific things that you're pointing out in the documents are connected to that code section, and that it's clear as to what they need to do. Again, though, you're not trying to solve their problem. The designer's responsibility is to do that. They may have an, a different way uh, in response as they revise and resubmit on how to get that, that condition to comply with the code. So we don't want to direct the design, let them do it. Just communicate the non-compliance. And of course, conduct yourself in a professional, courteous, impartial, responsive, and cooperative manner. Inspectors, 
So here we are. Um, inspectors are to perform required inspections. Required inspections are specifically de um, defined in section 108. Understand what the scope of those inspections are. Remember, inspections are designed to deal with the highest rated risk factors in code compliance. It's going to be things like fire resistance ratings, egress, things of that nature. Your job is not to, in essence, do the final punch out for the quality of the building at the end of the job. You're just verifying those things which are specific co-compliance issues. And they are per the construction documents. You shall inspect the work to the extent of the approval type. If it's a phase approval, you're only going to do that phase. Communicate the result of inspections as required in Section 108. Inspectors will go over this on Tuesday. I think it's Tuesday. Um, or maybe it's Monday. Um, but uh, understand Section 108 very carefully. There's a lot there. And then conduct yourself in a professional, courteous, impartial, responsive, and cooperative manner. And I want to add, understand the boundaries with regards to right of entry. There is a fine line between right of entry and trespassing. And it's very important that you understand that. Uh, we do get complaints on that issue still, even to this day. So I want to encourage you to do your best and, uh, and also understand that boundary. Well, this is concluding our um, presentation today. I do want to say this as a, as a point of encouragement. Um, I know a lot of you uh, out there and you're all doing a superb job. Um, even guys that and never in a million years would I ever expect to get a complaint on. Sometimes we get complaints on those people and it baffles me. But usually, again, we're dealing with owners who are learning the process. Uh, honestly, most owners and even some designers don't understand the intricacies of co-compliance and what the goals are from our side of this process. But uh, I do want to encourage you to just uh, know your duties and responsibilities, understand the board's process for uh, code enforcement, and just do the best job that you can. And as always, if you have questions about things, uh, feel free to call us. Board staff are here to help you. Uh, so if you get into a situation on a job site or during a plan review or building officials, if you uh, get into a, a place that you've never been before and trying to understand how to enforce something, please feel free to call us. Uh, we are here to help. So with that, I'll conclude. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to uh, communicate this information to you. And I hope that you have a great day. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rob. That was a great seminar. We really appreciate all the information